surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear for I am a child of God I'm no of God and from my mother's womb you have chosen me love that's called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through of God I'm no longer I'm no longer a slave to fear for I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God with the sacrifice and fill the arms of the Father this morning and sing I am surrounded and I am surrounded by the arms of my Father
God, we claim our identity this morning. I am a child of God. Tell the enemy you're a child of God. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could dance right through it. Now my fears were drowned in your perfect love. Yes, they were. You rescued me so I could stand and sing I am a child of God You split the sea You split the sea so I could walk right through it My fears were drowned in perfect love Yes, they were You rescued me so I could stand Bibles. Church, turn to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, near the end of your New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 3. Remember, we have a new members class in October. If you're interested, please contact the church office. Let us know how many. We have child care. We also provide lunch. So let us know so we can take care of that. We meet the, the second, I believe, the second and third Sunday. I don't have the bulletin in front of me for about a couple of hours after each Sunday service. Um, I want to share a passage. I want to take another week on evangelism. It's such a, a crucial topic. Um, I should have brought the stats that I received from the Southern Baptist Convention on how many baptisms in Hardin County. Uh, I think it was for every uh, of the 51 churches, it was 315, give or take a couple. And I think we crunched the numbers. It took 300 uh, members of a church to lead one person to Christ in Hardin County. And I was saying 195, 100 to 1 a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so in the Southern Baptist churches, it takes almost 300 people to see one person get saved. We need, a, we need a move of the Lord. And I want to talk about evangelism this morning from a different perspective. How many of you, uh, when you get that dream job, okay, if you were to win the lottery, how many of you would not contact a single relative of yours? What's the first thing you would do? Uh, you get that pay raise, you get that job you've been wanting, you're single and you've wanted to, you've been wanting to, to meet somebody that Mr. or Mrs. Wright and you finally think you've met them. Man, I know you're out there and you're on Facebook and Google and MySpace and your space and whoever get off my space and you're texting and you're doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's just, that's just the truth, man. When you hear good news and you've got it, you're ready to share. But you know, when things aren't going the best, we're not as quick to uh, let people know. When we've done something, a major boo-boo, oh, we're not that quick to put that out on, uh, on the social media. I want to talk to you this morning about sharing Christ in difficult times. Uh, in First Peter chapter 3, as we see so often over the years, the backdrop for this passage uh, is the church was going through some very difficult time. Uh, they were being persecuted. And so here in 1 Peter chapter 3, I want you to join with me. Uh, and we're just going to look at, for the most part, verses 13 through 17. Join with me as we read. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? 
But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are what? Now remind me to come back to that because that is a message in itself. And most Christians in America do not get that simple truth. So even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, what? When's the last time you said to somebody, man, I'm suffering and I'm going through a blessing? (laughs) We don't do that. But that's what the Lord is trying to share with you. Even if you should suffer for the sake of living for Christ, you're blessed. And do not be afraid of people threatening you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that to you. We're we're raising up politicians in this nation that hate righteousness. They are taking a stand against godly things that have been uh, held on to for hundreds of years. And it says, even if they're going to threaten you, do not be what? Do not be troubled, but set apart, depending on your version. Some of your versions say set apart. This one says sanctify the, the Lord God in your hearts. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And do it with pride and arrogance, disdain and impatience. Do it with what? Meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct eventually will what? will be ashamed. For it's better if it's the will of God. There are sometimes you suffer and, and, and it's truly demonic and other times God is allowing it for if it is uh, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil father would you help us to hear your voice God would you make our hearts tender God may you help us to say Lord when you convict us not justify not excuse not anything but say Lord that's me God And I don't want to be like that. I want to be like you. Father, would you bypass the human frailty of a speaker, Lord, that I, that where I'll make a mistake, I'll stammer, I'll stumble, stumble. Would you still communicate, Father, eternal truths to eternal beings? May they hear you, God. May the lost be drawn to you. May the saved, Lord, be drawn to the grace, the power, the holiness, and the truth of our Lord and our Savior. So, Father, arrest our attention. Help us to not be concerned with, Father, beating the Methodists or the Assemblies of God down to a golden corral, (laughs) to beat anybody to lunch, Lord, but to say, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. God, feed us, Lord. Feed us through your Spirit, Lord that we would be full gospel, God, that we would be filled with your love, Lord, ready to be not just spirit-filled, but spirit-spilled in a community that desperately needs you. Come in power, God. Help us to hear your voice. And we pray these things in Jesus' powerful name. And all the people of God said, turn to somebody and say, you better listen because he's going to be speaking to me this morning. Tell somebody that. Tell somebody that. So it's easy. I notice some of you, when you get your grandkids, man, you come to church and you got your phone and you know what you, you know what you do when you see your, your good friend? You know what you, you, Pastor Herb, and you're just there flash and you're showing me every grandkid and look at, here he is and and every, okay, that's 80 outfits. Okay. (laughs) That's a cute outfit. When you got good news, you want to share it, but I've realized, and you know this, that when things aren't that good, you don't want to share the good news, do you? All of a sudden, the good news doesn't seem as good because you're going through a difficult time. Church, I want to talk about how to evangelize. How do we witness when we don't feel like it? In fact, that's what I've titled the message this morning. How We have it on the screen. How to witness, being a witness when you don't feel like it. Because see, listen, it's easy when you got that promotion, that job, when you met that guy or girl. It's easy then to say, God is good. But how do you do it when the circumstances are not good? And we've heard just two great testimonies of Cedric and Lynn just get up and they basically preach my message. But listen, I had a professor, I'll never forget this, one of the most godly prayingest men in America, T.W. Hunt, in my seminary days. And I can still remember this. It was, I want to say, 35 years ago or so. And he said, class, he said, if you can only praise God when things are going good, you're not praising God, you're praising your circumstances. I'll never forget that. <laughs> what, a, what a great message. And so I want to talk to you this morning is how do we witness when you don't feel like it? You just don't feel like saying something. You're, not, you're going through a difficult time. You're, you, your marriage is on the rocks. You're married to a lost person. You're married to a person who's acting like they're lost. The health report is not good. There's not enough money at the end of the month. And there's nothing that's going to change the next month because there's no pay raise increase or inheritance coming in. 
How do you witness? <laughs> How do you witness when your spouse says, I don't love you anymore? I don't want to stay married to you anymore. How do you take that sucker punch to the gut when they said, I, I'm, you find out you're whatever's having an affair? Can we still be a witness for Christ even in the most dire straits of circumstances? I want to share with you this morning a message then. How do we share Christ when you lack the desire? Look at, I want to share with you, I'm going to, I'm going to boil it down to four points. Look at verse 15 and 16. Let's start there. But set apart, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who's asking you for a reason for the hope that is within you. Stop right there. A lot of times when we read the Bible, we forget the context. The context is persecution. Some people are being fired. Some people are not even not being hired. Some people aren't allowed to live in that village. Some people are losing their freedom. Others are being denied basic food. You can't shop or you can't whatever. Others are being thrown in jail, and their uh, their loved ones not only lose their freedom, but they're losing their lives. And then here, this is the context, and they're, they're living in such a way, look what he says, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who what? Now, why would somebody ask you, how can you still hang on to God if you're not what? You're going through a very, very what? So they know that as a Christian, you're suffering at your job because you love the Lord. And so a lost person in this context, they're watching and they're saying, hey, you're going through a difficult time. You know, uh, what happened, you know, if this is happening to your spouse, they're so young. If this happening to your child, where is God? I thought you loved God. And this is what scripture says, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is what? So what they're saying is, hey, when those kind of things happen to us, first of all, we don't even serve God, but you're still hanging on to God. There's a, there's a lady in the Old Testament, you'll remember her name. Her husband was godly. He was, a, he was a righteous guy. And he went through about as bad a times as anybody in the Bible, if not worse. And remember, he lost all his children, all his, his livestock, his home. He got boils. And do you remember what his wife said to him? Curse God and what? And she acted like a lost, a lost lady. But what, what happens is when you're going through difficult times, it's sure hard to be a witness for Christ, right? Here's the deal. You're the best witness for Christ when you're going through the worst of your times. Listen to me. If everything's going good, people aren't going to be surprised that you're saying God is good. Yeah, God is good. You got an inheritance. A relative died. You got money left because you got a job. You got a promotion because you're getting. Of course, they're going to say that. But my friend, when you're going through suffering, injustice, mistreated, all those things, and you keep saying God is good, you got their attention. When you keep, why do you keep going to that church? Why do you keep tithing? What do you, whatever it is, why do you keep saying God is good in light of what's happening to your spouse, your parent, your child, your grandchild? And Cedric already preached that. God is good whether my circumstances are good or not. I, I, was, uh, I went to Sam's not too long ago. Have you ever seen how many big screen TVs they have? <clears throat> I mean, they're like eight, 85 feet wide, right? All right, right a little exaggerated. 84 feet wide. Oh, these monster, and sometimes they'll have this commercial. You ever see a commercial? <clears throat> and with these flat screen TVs, everything looks real. You kind of almost want to reach and kind of say, is that, is that Dak Prescott throwing a TD pass for Dallas? Let, let me touch that right there. But they look so real now with these ridiculously flat screen TVs. Have you ever seen a commercial? I mean, they have a picture of that hamburger. I can't remember which one I saw, Rallies or Arby's. And man, they made that hamburger look I mean, it was dripping with grease, Look, butter, and the cheese was melted. And the hamburger looked this thick, but you know when you buy it, it's underneath the pickle, right? I mean, you're looking for it. It's, it's only that big. But, I mean, they made that hamburger look so th I almost went over to the screen and went, you know what I'm saying? I just give it a good old lick. Cheese was dripping out. I mean, it looked like the best. Y'all know what I'm talking? You ever seen that at your house? Tell the truth. We're in the house of the Lord. Tell the truth and shame the devil. Now, don't, don't act spiritual. How many of you have watched a commercial like that? They had a great shake or a burger. You weren't really super hungry, but that commercial, that hamburger looked so delicious to that shake, you got out of your bedroom or your living room, put on your slippers or your shoes. You went to wherever, oh, Charlie's in order. Or you went to Rally's or Arby's, and you got yourself the hamburger, the chicken, the shake. Now, we're in the house of the Lord. How many of you other than me have done that once in the last year or two? 
Oh, the Lord shall smite thee for not being honest, saith the Lord. Come on, you never once. Oh, my sir, you all are a bunch of liars. Thank you, brother. Yeah, I see that hand over there. You know what I'm talking about. The first service said, but I wanted to go. I just didn't have any money. Okay, well, it's the same point. Yeah. <laughs> that commercial is trying to make you hungry. And it often does it. This is what this passage is saying. Live your life so much that you make lost people hungry and thirsty for God. They see that ridiculous peace and joy that you have in the midst of something difficult. And they're saying, share with me, how do you have hope in the midst of terrible circumstances? Do you want to evangelize? Here's here's the first one I want to share with you. Make people thirsty by how you live. Not just quoting scripture for, hey, you need to repent and get right with God. Live such that when you're suffering injustice, when you're being mistreated, when when times are difficult, when loved ones are are not being faithful to you, whatever it might be, that they still see that that all-encompassing joy and peace that just permeates all that you do and say, and they ask you. You don't even have to say anything. It is so evident to them that they say, share with me that, that reason for the hope that you have within you in your outline how do we evangelize when we don't feel like it make people thirsty especially when you're at your most difficult time that's when your words will carry the most weight not when things are going good. They listen. You get a drunk, and you get a you give a drunk a bottle of of Jim Beam or Jack Daniels or or, or Mad Dog or Ripple or whatever it is. You know how he's going to act. Because <laughs> even a sinner knows how to be happy when things are good. What separates you from everybody else is you continue to live for His glory when things are really really bad. A in your outline. It's this. Make people thirsty. By how you live. Here's a second truth that I want to share with you. And it's this. Look at, uh, look at verse 16. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with pride and impatience. With what? With meekness and in fear. Listen, sometimes people at work or, or you're in your own family, it could be a own family member could be somebody at school. They will mock you because you want to live for the Lord. They will mock you because you take a stand for something that's biblical. What we often do as Christians, we return evil for evil. We get smart out like that with them. We want to show them up. That's not the spirit of Christ. Jesus is not a million miles. I'm going to share an illustration I think I used last year, but it comes to mind. I'll do it again. I remember when I used to wash windows in my seminary days. And it was a little, uh, a little deli. It's kind of like that cobbler cafe right over by the uh, courthouse across the street, really small, just a couple of windows. And I remember, long story short, I was, I was washing the windows, and there was only one window to go, and it was the, the big window, and I washed the outside, and I needed to wash the inside. So long story short, I went inside, I had my bucket and my squeegee and my wand, and I was just going to pass through, and, and I didn't ask the lady to, to move her chair back. Her chair was close to the window right here, and I was just going to, you know, quietly slip by. She and another lady were talking, and she said, excuse me, and I said, no, ma'am, excuse me. She said, excuse me, like, I'm not going to let you pass, and I'm thinking, well, okay, you know what I'm saying? Bless her heart, so... You know, she's a customer. I, you know, I didn't want to get the boss man. So I went, washed the, the main door again. People are always coming in and out, touching it with their hands. And I go and I talk to the, you know, the guy at the cashier. And then she gets ready to leave. <clears throat> and so the Lord put it in my heart. You know, I think of that scripture verse. If your enemy's hungry, give them something to eat. And if they're thirsty, give them something to drink. And so you'll, you'll heap hot coals on their head. In other words, don't return evil for evil. Be kind to people. So I, when she finished paying, I went over to the, there's only one door, one little door out of, and so I went over to the door and I opened it for her, you know what I'm saying? And I said, God bless you, ma'am. Well, I guess because she was rude to me for no reason, she thought I was saying something mean. She said, what did you say? And I said, God bless you, ma'am, have a good day. And when she heard that the second time, she put her head down in embarrassment and left. We don't do things to, I'm gonna, that's not the heart of Christ. You know what, what if... This morning, she heard that her husband had an affair on her. What if she found out her mother died? And if you'll have compassion when you speak to people and quit trying to nail them and nail them and nail them, 
we'll never win people like that. You're going to kill them with kindness. You're not going to kill them with harshness. But sanctify the Lord God and, and give a reason for the hope within you with what? With meekness and in fear. That means you don't respond harsh to people. when they're, Where's your God now? Yeah, aren't you the guy that prays all the time? Well, how come your spouse this? How come your grandchild this? How come that boss this, your boss is? And they will come back and try to jab you and nail you. The Bible says you don't respond according to them, but you respond according to the meekness of Christ. In meekness and with fear, the fear of the fear of God, the reverence, the hey, you know what, man, I could be lost again. I did that when I was lost. Hey, I could walk away from God if it wasn't for his grace and his goodness. That you respond to people with meekness and in fear. I heard a story of a lady, and she obviously was in a hurry. I know nobody ever here has ever been in a hurry when you you've been driving, but she was just tailgating this guy. And long story short, all of us have been driving 30, 40, 50, and the light turns yellow. Well, if you're 20 feet away, what do you normally do? You're going 50 miles an hour. What do we all do? Well, you go because you're not going to slam and stop in the middle of the road. So we all have to judge. And in this particular case, the, the guy in front of her, it turned yellow. He didn't think he'd have enough time. And so he kind of slammed on his brakes. Well, the lady behind that was in a hurry, she went ballistic. I mean, she went nuts. She started honking her horn nonstop, beating on her, on her steering wheel. And you could just see that the vein. And she, was, and she wasn't saying, God bless you. You know what I'm saying? With, with the words she was saying with her mouth. And she did it for like 25 or 30 seconds. Anyway, the guy goes on to say that all of a sudden there was a, there was a tap on her window. And she turns, and it was a local police officer. And he says, ma'am, he says, ma'am, can you step outside? Longest story. She ordered to exit her car with her hands up. He took her to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, placed in a holding cell. I guess nowadays this poor cop would be in jail for 30 years. After a couple of hours, a policeman approached the cell, opened the door. She was escorted back to the booking desk where the arresting officer was waiting for her with her personal effects. He said, ma'am, I'm sorry for the mistake. You see, I pulled up behind your car when you were blowing your horn, flipping off the guy in front of you, and cussing a blue streak at him. I noticed on your car, ma'am, there was a what would Jesus do bumper sticker. And not only that, your license plate had choose life around it. And then on the other side, it said, follow me to Sunday school bumper sticker on the other. And, and not only that, on your trunk, I saw the fish emblem. And ma'am, naturally, I just assumed when I saw that and then I saw your behavior, I thought it was a stolen car. <laughs> This is a true story. This guy tells on himself. He went to a restaurant, as he normally does, and he ordered. And when the waitress brought the, the, the steak out, he cut it open and said, this is too raw. It's too red. I, I, this is not cooked well enough. Right? And the waitress, very gracious, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She goes, she gets it, she comes back. Comes back a couple of minutes later, he cuts it. This is, what did you put this in a nuclear uh, uh, reactor? This thing is way overcooked. And she said, I'm sorry, sir. She goes, takes it back, gets another one, brings it to him, cuts it open. He kind of like, finally, you know what I'm saying? And he cuts, okay, it's good. But then he looks over at his potato and he cuts it. You know, sometimes potatoes can have those little black kind of, you know, yeah, those little black things in them, you know, sometimes the skin of it. And there was that. And he, he acted like someone shot his grandma. And he said, what? This is a bad, you, this is a bad potato, waitress. And I thought this waitress had guts. And this is what she did. She said, I'm sorry, sir. This is a bad potato. She picks up the potato, he said, looks at the potato and said, you're a bad, bad potato. Bad. And she spanks the potato. You are a bad, bad potato. And she said, now behave. And she puts the potato right back down. But the guy said, Listen, we all, have a, we all have a blind spot. Every one of us does. Every one of us does. And you're normally the last person to know when you have a blind spot. Right? How many of you have ever said, I got bad breath? <gasps> Whew! How many have ever done that to yourself? How many have ever gone, Whoo, stinky? No. You know how you know you have bad breath? Somebody has to what? Somebody has to tell you. Right? All of us have areas of our life that aren't quite Christ-like. And this guy, that the story I'm telling, said he didn't know what a jerk he had been when he was 
ordering and gone to restaurants. He was picky, demanding. And he said that waitress doing that to him then convicted him that sometimes he was a jerk in dealing with other people. Hmm. Here's the second truth that I want to share with you then in your outline. Look at uh, Colossians 4, 6. Walk in wisdom towards those who are what? The next, uh, the next one. Walk in wisdom. Look at Colossians 4, 6. Yeah. Towards those who are what? That means when you go to work, when y'all go to your school, when you go shopping, when you're around a bunch of heathens and pagans, right? What does the Bible say? Be wise. I might say something to Cedric. I might say something to Jack or to, or to Eddie because we're friends. He knows the way I'm saying it. I, I, we fully understand. I get it. But when you're with lost people, they're looking for a reason not to follow Jesus. Don't give it to them. <laughs> they're looking to pick. They're looking to twist anything. And the Bible says, walk in wisdom. When you're hanging around lost people, to those who are outside of the body of Christ, redeeming the what? Take advantage when you're around those lost people. Let your speech always be with what? Always be seasoned with grace. When you talk to people, let your speech always be seasoned with grace. Seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer what? Each person. Think about it, ladies. You come home and it's the fourth time that you ask your husband to vacuum and he hasn't vacuumed. This is four straight weeks. Sweetheart, I asked you to vacuum. How about if you said, honey, when you vacuum, I love to watch your biceps ripple. <laughs> you know what that husband's going to do? Where's the vacuum? <laughs> Where, he's going to suck up his gut. He's going to go. But isn't it amazing? The same thing, but if you said it with grace. Some of you guys are thinking, or you know what? Honey, this is three weeks ago. I asked you on a Friday. I asked you to do the dishes. What if you say, honey, you've never looked more attractive to me than when you're doing dishes and drying them. What do you think about that? What do you think about that, Amanda? Let me tell you this. Your, your husband would be running to the do the dishes. Any more dishes, honey? What else do you want me to wash? Here, let me, let me mess up a dish so I can wash another one. So what am I saying in your outline? How do we witness when we're, how do we share Christ when we're being, times are difficult, going through a difficult time, or, or being mistreated, abused, or going through injustice? Here's B in your outline. When you share biblical truths with people, it's how you say it more than what you say. It's your tone of voice. It, it, it's not the sharing, oh, I got to know this right scripture verse. No, it has really very little to do with that. It's the communication. It's the meekness. It's, it's those things that Scripture is talking about. This is a true story. In Wales, early 1900s, it was the, 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 the great revival that hit our world that started in Wales uh, that spread all around the world, came to our country. Uh, Zusa Street revival and others that occurred. But long story short, uh, the two largest coal mining cities in the, in the world were in... Um, were in Wales. Uh, they were in Barrie, and uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the other uh, coal mine, Cardiff. Yeah, the two largest. Longest story short, the coal miners were, were a rough, rough bunch. And as this revival spread, a lot of them started getting saved. And as they started getting saved, you know what? You know what? One part of your life that has changed is your what? Your tongue. And these guys had cursed like a sailor down in the uh, uh, down in the coal mines. You know cursing the, the mules, telling them to work. After they got saved, they weren't cursing. And guess what the mules quit doing? They had to switch the mules. The mules weren't responding to, come here, little donkey. They only knew you yeah, blankety blank. They literally had to lift all the old mules out, put new ones that would respond to, come here, little mule, let me help you along. That's a true story. When you're sharing biblical truth, Guys, it's not, you shouldn't be drinking. You shouldn't be sleeping around. Guys, you'll just, you'll lose it. You lost it. But it's sharing out of, man, I understand how you can get caught up in that. Man, I used to get caught up in, let me tell you, before I came to know Christ, or even now I'm struggling in this area, but let me tell you how God is helping me overcome. Here's the second truth. How do you evangelize when you're sharing biblical truths with people? It's not how you say it. I mean, it's how you say it more than the actual words that you are speaking. Here's a third truth as we look at this passage. 
Uh, here's a couple of scripture verses. Look at 1 John 4. And here's Romans 5. It says this, um, the verse here, it says, Have a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct will be ashamed. Listen, my friend, I don't go around defending myself. I learned this 30-something years ago. If, if what God knows is enough, then it's enough for me. If I got everybody on my side, all my elders, deacons, Sunday school teachers, but it's not true and I'm giving a good front, then what does it matter to God? And if I got everybody against me, but God knows what's true, then God knows what's true. He'll defend me on judgment day. I don't get caught defending myself. That's a trap. Don't fall for that. You do the right thing and let God do the, uh, do the covering. And, but it says this. Uh, uh, there's two great verses. For when we were still without strength, not able to save ourselves, not able to be holy and godly, not able on our own to be, to, to be right in the eyes of God, in that perfect time, in that due time, Christ died for saints and good people. Christ died for who? That means turn to, the, turn to the person next to you and says, he's talking to you. <laughs> he's talking to you. The ungodly is everybody. That's every one of us until we become a saint, until we come to know the Lord. Christ did not die for good people. He died for lost people, ungodly people. Look what it says in 1 John. In this is love. You want to know what love is? Not that what? Not that you love God, but that God loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the payment for us. This is love, not what you do. I tithe, I go to church, I quit my drinking and smoking. That's not love. Love is, look what God did for me. (laughs) I didn't come into God's heart. He came into my heart. Uh, My blood didn't do anything for Him, but His blood did everything for me. (laughs) Here's the the point I'm trying to make. Go back to that that verse right there when he says this, uh, verse uh, 16, having a good conscience, that means I can look back and say, you know, before God, the Holy Spirit, I I am right, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be what? They might be ashamed. Listen, before this era of political correctness, I've always thought, this is a harsh word, but I'll use it. I always thought that's the stupidest thing I ever heard, being politically correct. Well, what do you mean politically correct? Who's politics? Whigs, Tories, the Republicans, the Democrats? I want to be biblically correct. I don't care what my politician says. If it goes against the word of God, I'm going to follow God. I don't want to be politically correct. If you're asking me to put my stamp of approval on something that's sinful, I'm not going to say, yes, that's right. God would approve of it. And, and so, long story short, before that age, when parents could be parents, this dad told a story. And he said, you know, for the last five years, his kid was 10 years old. And for the last five years, he had his kid in, in, in Sunday school, in church. He said, you know what? I wasn't overly harsh with my kid. I, I didn't let him get away with stuff. I, I was lovingly firm when I had to be. I think I was patient when he would speak. I'm not perfect, but I mean, I was a decent dad. You know, I taught him the things of God. I didn't live a hypocritical life at home. I didn't get drunk. I wasn't having an affair. I wasn't looking at trashy stuff. I wasn't spending all my money on, you know, gambling it all away. He said, I was a, you know, I was a decent husband. I was a decent and dad, but his, his, his 10-year-old boy had really been going through rebellion at school, getting in trouble and getting in trouble. And it was embarrassing getting a phone call from the teacher. And he said, you know, I don't know. I can't explain it. He's not like this around home. But if you want to know how you really are, get away from authority and you, we'll see how you really are. And so when the kid was going to school, he was just really misbehaving. And so the dad was really torn. and couldn't figure out why. And he would tell the teacher, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I go fishing. I take him fishing. I go to his ball games. I mean, as much as I can, when I get off work, I spend time with my son and I try to love him and teach him about Christ. Longest story short, he'd already told the son like seven trillion times, don't play with your baseball against throwing it against a wall in your room. It put dance in the wall and we also have glass. And you can imagine what his son did that, that evening. Got his baseball, threw it against the wall, hit the glass, and broke it. Back in several decades ago, replacing a window was a lot of money. It was a little different than it is now. It was a lot for a dad. And his dad just lost it. He was so furious. He couldn't believe it. I've told him a thousand times not to do that. So he said, come on, come to my room. So his son comes to his room. And he, the last several months, he'd been getting in trouble so often. He said he, his son assumed the position. <laughs> he already knew, you know what I'm saying? Dad's going to whip my rear end. Dad gets a belt. That was in our days, you young people. That's how we disciplined our kids, right? 
Now, still, yeah, yeah, you just have to be quiet. The social services will give you 20 years in jail. It's like, you know, I'm abusing my kids. You're abusing your kids. You know what? You don't teach them about the Word of God and you let them watch all sorts of trash on TV. You're abusing your kid. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> that's a whole other story. <laughs> Teaching discipline in a godly way. We're not talking about baseball bats over the face. We're talking about popping their little rear end. So, long story short, his, his 10 year old boy bent over ready for a pop. And the son said, No, son, come here. And so he takes off his belt, and he hands his son the belt, and then he starts seeing him. He thinks, oh, he's going to roll up his sleeves to where he's really going to bend his elbows, and the kid really started getting afraid. And so the dad totally takes off his shirt, and his dad bends over and says, I want you to spank me, son. I want you to spank me seven times. And the kid wouldn't do it. Daniel said, I want you to spank me, son. So there's got to be a punishment for what you did. He wouldn't do it. And then he gave him some sissy spanks. You know what I'm saying? He spanked his dad real like a little pillow. He said, no, I want you to spank me, a hard spank for what you've done, your defiance. And finally hits his dad, and he does it seven times. He pops his dad pretty good on the back, and it, it breaks the kid. The kid's broken. And the dad says, you know what that represents? He said, no, he says, that represents the stripes Jesus took for us when he was innocent and we were guilty. He said, do you know who killed Jesus? And the 10-year-old boy said, yeah. Uh, the Romans did. He said, no, son, it wasn't Romans. Oh, that's right. It was the Jewish people. He said, no, it wasn't Jewish people. He said, dad, I forgot who did it. He said, it was the sins of everybody. Your sins caused Jesus to die, but he willingly took the punishment for you. And when you have whooped me, my, my son, I, I'm innocent. You're guilty. But there's always a cost to sin. He said his son broke. I mean, he had tried for months and months and months and months and trying to work with his kid. Couldn't do it. But when he finally understood the grace of God, when he finally understood what Jesus did, he said, my son didn't become perfect, but I'm telling you, he was changed from that day on. He, uh, the, yeah, we had problems occasionally, but nothing like that. It was because the cross of Christ humbled my son when he realized there are consequences to sin. Here's the third point I'm making. How do we evangelize? Listen, this is the mistake we make. There's a great passage in Scripture. Jesus talking of the Pharisees. He said, you travel land and sea to make a convert, and when you do, you make them twice the son of hell as you are. You're very picky. You're looking for perfect people to, to convert so that they can be big leaders. And Jesus saying, no, 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 no. The gospel is not for perfect people. It's for imperfect people. It's for sinners and ungodly people that want to know the Lord. And, and this is the point I'm trying to make as we look at point number three. Oftentimes, we have an easy time loving a godly person, but we have a difficult time loving the ungodly. The gospel, my friend, is not loving Billy Graham or Mother Teresa. It's loving that person at work that's trying to get you in trouble. It's loving that spouse that is hurting you and wounding you. It's, it's, it's loving that child that continues to rebel and rebel against you and doesn't want to have anything to do with God and mocks you. The gospel then is just not loving the saint, my friend. The gospel is loving the sinner. Amen. And if, if you really want to know when you're most effective, when God puts ungodly people around you that are not acting godly, He puts you there for such a time as this. And that person you keep trying to get rid of, God keeps trying to bring them across your path because you're the only one that's going to be Jesus to them. <laughs> Here's the third truth this morning. Don't just love saints, love sinners as well. People are worth everything to God and they should be to us. It's easy to love the lovable, my friend, but God has put you to love those who do not love God or do not love you. And here's the last point, church. I know you're shocked that I'm actually going to be through at an early time, but I want you to get fired up for the movie tonight. Let you go home and rest. Here's the last uh, truth that I want to share with you. And there's quite a few. Let me just share with you about three or four verses that set up this last point. Look at Matthew and Romans. Look at Acts. And look at Colossians. Uh, John says, therefore, Jesus answered and said to them, don't hey, quit complaining, quit murmuring behind my back. No one can come to me unless what? So the only way a person can get saved is the, if the Holy Spirit what? Draws people to him. You don't come to God on your IQ. I don't care who you are, the, the sharpest mensa, the guy with the highest IQ. You don't figure God out. The finite cannot grasp the infinite. 
A cockroach cannot do math, much less trigonometry or calculus. It's above their pay grade. There's no way that your little mind can grasp the greatness of God, but God can come down to your level. And there's no way a man can ever come to God unless the Holy Spirit draws him what Jesus is saying. Look what it says here in Colossians. Continually, casually in prayer. Huh? Continue what? Earnestly in prayer, being vigilant. You know what a vigilante is. Somebody that they take it by storm. They're vigilant. Being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. What does that mean? When you, when do you give thanks? After you've what? Receive something. So part of faith and prayers, I'm already thanking God that my supervisor is going to get right or saved. I'm already thanking God that my spouse is going to do this. I'm already thanking God that my child or my grandchild, that is faith. I'm thanking God for what I believe he is going to do. Being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, also praying for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I'm also what? Hey, the reason I'm in prison is because I'm following Christ. Look at this tremendous attitude. And this is what he says. Pray that I may make it manifest as I what? This great speaker says, hey, would you pray for me so I would know how to witness to my captor, the, the, the jailer and the guy that's got me in this prison? Would you pray that God would give me the right words to witness to him? What a beautiful attitude this apostle Paul had. Here's a couple of more quick scripture verses. Acts 26, Paul is sharing his salvation testimony. And he's, I think he's with Felix or Festus. And he's sharing and he's there in Acts 26. And when we had fallen to the ground, remember he was riding on his horse. I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, this was before his name was changed to Paul. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it hard, is it hard for you to kick against the goads, kick against the grain? So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. 17, I will deliver you from the Jewish people. Those were the religious people that didn't know the Lord. Uh, I will deliver you from the legalists, the Jewish people, as well as also from the Gentiles to whom I'm now sending you to, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by, me, by faith in me. Pray that God would open the eyes of the lost because they're blinded by a dark curtain from Satan. Here's one more verse, and then we'll look at this last point. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, all, hey, the, the, the radical Muslims practice this. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and what? Hate the infidels, hate your enemy, but I say to you what? Now, now, look what he says. I think this covers about every person that you work with, that you go to a school with, a ballpark, whatever, that, 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 that is not in favor of the gospel or you. But I say, one, what? Love your enemies. Two, bless them if they curse you. Three, find something to do for them. That's what it's saying. Do good to them. Find something to do for them. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and what? And persecute you. Listen to me. I've, I've learned this 35 years ago that somebody said to me once, Herb, I never see you mad at somebody or in a bad mood. And I thought, you haven't been around me long enough. Talk to my wife. <laughs> but I learned this a long time ago. And it's biblical. If I will pray for people that have lied, that have stolen, that have a, a, a twisted truth, if I pray for them, I can't be mad at them. I pray that none of my deacons or elders say, you know, Herb, you have a bad attitude towards somebody. I've learned a long time ago that if I pray for them in my heart, I can't get mad at them. I have pity for them. I feel bad that they would say that, that, that they're going to get caught. God records everything. He'll expose it one day. But what I'm saying is, I don't know who is or what, and I don't know how many, but if you learn in your heart to pray for people, you lose your anger towards them. And not only do you lose your anger, but then you start having sympathy. You know, bless, man, if I had a marriage where my spouse walked out of me or had an affair, if I had a dad that beat me and called me trash, you know, maybe I would have a lot of junk that I'm working through. And, you know, maybe I could do those things too. You know, maybe I've even done some of those things that I'm not even aware of. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, suffering the most uh, injustice of all time, God being crucified, you know, when he was getting nailed, 
He didn't say, Father, may you stick it to every human being for what they've done to me. Father, would you damn mankind? Would you strike every one of them deaf, dumb, and mute this second? He, he prayed the greatest prayer in the history of the world. He said, Father, would you, would you have mercy and forgive them? They don't have a clue. what They are so blind in darkness, they have no clue. The prayer of Jesus <laughs> for his enemies allowed every one of us to get saved. And the reason you're saved, if you're saved here and I'm saved, is because Jesus prayed for his enemies. And so what am I saying to you? Here, here's the last point I'm saying to you. How do you, how do you evangelize? How do you witness when somebody's trying to get you fired at work? When somebody's trying to lie, trying to get you in trouble, when somebody, uh, they reject you because of your color of skin? We could go on and on. How do you respond the same way Jesus responded? Here's, no, here's D in your outline. You got to pray the lost into salvation. You got to start listing them out. And start praying for that person. You'll develop empathy. You'll develop sympathy. As you begin to just intercede and pray for them, God will, God will switch your heart. Let me tell you about the story of a guy named John Hyde. We'll close with this. He's from Illinois in the late 1800s. He went to become a missionary in India. Uh, read his biography. It's better than anything you'll watch on, on YouTube or Dancing with the Stars or, you know what I'm saying, Lucky Stars or Lucky Charms or whatever the, whatever's out there. Uh, John, his name was John Hyde. He prayed so much, they called him Praying Hyde. Can you imagine your name being called Praying Sally, Praying Tim? <laughs> you pray so much, that's what they know you But He became a missionary. He went to India. He had a heart for the uh, Indians in the late, uh, early 1900s. Tremendous burden. They said he went oftentimes sleepless, praying for the people. In 1908, he said, I think God has given me enough faith that I'm going to ask God to give me one soul. I'm going to pray for one person to get saved every day. And there, there in India, on the mission field, he prayed. And he said that, that, that day someone got saved that whole week and that month and the next month and the sixth month. He said, it might be 11 o'clock at night. And if I had led somebody to Christ, I would get up and I would walk around. I'd go to stores and I would just say, Lord, who, do, who am I supposed to witness to? Led by the Holy Spirit, go to people. He led one person to Christ every day for a year. He said at the end of 1908 and 1909, said, God, could you give me faith for two? I thought, can you give me faith for two? And he acted like his faith was weak. I thought, you've led more to Christ in, in, in one year than all of the churches in Hardin County in an entire year. He said, Lord, would you give me faith for two people? He prayed that first day two got saved, and the rest of that week, that whole month, three months, six months, nine months, a year later, he led two people to Christ. The next year, 1910, he said, Father, could you give me faith for four? Can, can you help me lead four people to Christ? He did it that first day, that whole week, that month, three months, six months, a year. He led four people to Christ every day, at least, sometimes more. His health gave out. He's not an old man. He came back, and the doctors checked his heart out, and they said, we've never seen anything like this. His heart had shifted to the other side. He was an intercessor. He would pray. He would moan. He would weep, praying for the souls of the people in India, and he died in 1911. But he died saying, to God be the glory. Souls, souls for God, souls for God. So what am I saying? My friend, listen, you want to pray for that person that's giving you a hard time? You want to see them saved? You got to pray for them. It's not how clever you are, your line of argument. I'm going to say this. I'm gonna, no, you pray and the Holy Spirit will work when you're gone from them. Intercede and pray and watch what God will do. We're heaven's fun creation, His pride and adoration, treasures woven by His love. His careful hands, they hold us, safe within His promise of calling and of destiny.